Focusing now on the Southeast Asian nation of Myanmar, where overnight the military staged a coup and detained senior politicians, including the country's leader. Myanmar, also known as Burma, is located on the Indian Ocean, sharing a border with India, China, Thailand, and Laos. The military seizure of power follows a recent election that senior army officials have criticized as riddled with widespread fraud, though they have not provided any specific examples. The military-run television station aired an announcement confirming a high-ranking general would assume power for a one-year period. The takeover came the same morning that Myanmar's new parliamentary session was set to begin. The military argues the overthrow was legal, citing a constitutional clause that hands power to the military in cases of national emergency. And the ruling party, led by Nobel laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi released a statement condemning that coup and that sentiment being echoed by most of the international community. The Biden administration released a statement that read in part, quote, the United States removed sanctions on Burma over the past decade based on progress toward democracy. The reversal of that progress will necessitate an immediate review of our sanction laws and authorities followed by appropriate action. Probably noticed the country referred to as both Myanmar and Burma. The name change was actually introduced in 1989, and most nations recognize Myanmar as the official name, but some countries, including the U.S. and also the U.K., continue to use the name Burma. According to the United States Institute of Peace, quote, the U.S. and others that have not recognized the name change generally argue that it was made without the consent of the people and was thus illegitimate. The military regime, however, has said that Burma only refers to its largest ethnic group and is not inclusive of the country's other 134 ethnic communities. In practice, however, both terms have been used for centuries. Joining us now to talk about the situation in Myanmar is national security and foreign policy expert James Carafano, a vice president at the Washington-based Heritage Foundation. He's also a 25-year Army veteran. We have a lot to get to, James. Let's start with Myanmar, President Biden's first foreign policy challenge. This sort of came out of nowhere. What do you think was going on behind the scenes at the White House as this coup went down? Well, I, I think there's there's two really important lessons learned here, and I think the White House is kind of struggling how to deal with it. Normalizing relations with Myanmar or Burma was actually the Obama administration's idea, and the idea was, oh, we'll, we'll lift the sanctions and they'll move towards uh, civilian rule. That was always a lie. The military always had control. They, they wrote the Constitution. Actually, they can take that power because they wrote the Constitution. The Constitution says they can do whatever they want. So now they find themselves in a situation where it was the Obama team, all of whom are now back in government, who, who set up this thing about empowering the generals, and, and now they have to deal with that. So they really need to hammer these guys hard, and that goes against every policy they had when they were in office. But the other thing is, is look, the generals would not be all powerful if it wasn't for China. Burma is clearly in China's sphere of influence. China is the world's largest enabler of authoritarian regimes. They flourish because of China, and, and the, the Biden team is going to have to take a tough line on China. So not only are they going to have to crack down on Burma, which the Chinese won't like, they need to be tough on China. Again, these are things the Obama administration didn't do, but the Biden team, if they want to leave, they have to become more comfortable. Well, the path to democracy has been very difficult, James. There's been genocide against the Rohingya minority in the country. China, as you mentioned, certainly watching closely to see how this plays out. Now, a coup, do you think you say they have to do something severe? Does this rise to a level, in your opinion, that could ultimately involve U.S. military action? No, because look, first of all, Burma is, is not a strategic interest in the United States. Second, it's, it's clearly, an, it's, it's totally controlled by China. Um, and uh, it's not a military response here. It's, but the United States has a, has a human rights obligation. Ironically, beyond the, the, the uh, um, abuses against the Rohingya, the single greatest genocide in the world today is being perpetuated by China. And you know, we have to make clear to people that there's a distinction between us and the Chinese. And, and if we let the Chinese rewrite the international norms so it's okay for them to do genocide, it's okay for them to support authoritarian regimes, and it's not okay for the United States to, to call these things out, then we're going to live in a very sad and depressing world. So this calls really for a diplomatic, economic, uh, and, and political response, not a military one. For what ultimate end, do you think? What do you see happening here if sanctions don't work? 
Well, sanctions will work in the sense that we will, we will isolate ourselves from the regime. People have to make a choice in this world. You know, fundamentally, the United States and, and like-minded countries in the free world, we believe in human rights, we believe in the free enterprise system, and we believe in free and active governments. The Chinese, they don't believe in any of those things. In fact, they see those things as obstacles to their expansion of influence. So if we don't take a stand on those equities and rally other countries to our side, those, those, those will come in jeopardy in our lifetime. Not in our lifetime, in this decade. Do you think sanctions will work in releasing the president and removing the military from power? No, but I think it will send a strong signal that the United States is opposed to authoritarian regimes, that the United States is an, uh, in opposition to genocide and in opposition to the Chinese government using the expansion of its influence to put in place despicable regimes around the world that harm humans and ultimately will harm our interests as well. A couple of quick questions, James. First, uh, with Russia, uh, I'm curious what you think of the situation there. More protests over the weekend, some 5,000 people detained, this all dealing with Alexei Navalny. How do you think that ends, and what do you think we know about the poisonings there? Well, I don't know if we know how it ends. Uh, you know, Navalny's not this great, he, he's not George Washington. He actually supported the invasion of, of Crimea. Uh, he supports the occupation of Georgia. Um, but on the other hand, he represents a complete lack of democracy. And now, and I don't know how it ends, and I don't even think inside Russia they know how it ends. But now is not the time for the United States to make life easy for Vladimir Putin. And even though this administration says we want to be tough on Russia, and now is the time to be tough on Russia, they, they already signed a new START treaty. They renewed the new START treaty with Russia, which only is good for the Russians, does nothing for us. It's a gimme to Putin. Um, they've, they've been making indications they want to cut a deal on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which, which undermines uh, economic uh, energy security in Europe and get in power as Russia. So their words are, we're going to be tough at Russia. That's job one. But so far, every action they've taken towards the Russians has been you know, soft as a pillow. They, they've had some tough words. And the, the president said, I raised these issues with Putin in a phone call. But what the Russians respond to is action, not words. And what we've heard from the Biden administration so far is words, not action. We'll see. James Carafano, we're out of time. But thank you for yours tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.